Not time to push record. There we go. Welcome, welcome. And, and it is actually lecture three. Yeah. And as you can notice from the small text on this slide, it is May the 4th. So all of us Star Wars fans, let's make the most of it. We'll put this one over here. Mm. Okay, here we are. Uh, after this lecture, we're halfway through. Whether you like it or not, I don't know. Uh, but today we're going to talk a couple of fashionable words and then about shared meanings and well, let's see how it goes. And, and, and we're going to, I'm going to actually introduce exercise number three now in the beginning and not in the end. Let's see how that goes and what happens to you. But try to keep this lively so that you don't fall asleep or go away. Um, I think one question you might be asking at this stage of the course, why is there so much about agile culture and all this fanciful lean and thinking, lean startup thinking, maybe design thinking, all of this? And then it's an organizational change and change management, much, much more. And I think last time we had a good discussion, thanks to Katarina, about differences between crisis management and change management. And I think that was a great example that this is, you know, you could almost make a whole degree out of these things. So there's much more into this, no doubt about it. But then nevertheless, taking this kind of lean, agile design perspective, especially today's lecture, is very practical. I think it's something that is talked. It's something that is in the world, in the, out there, in the real world, being talked and used and, and you know, adopted all the time. And it is a great example of how certain ways of thinking actually are taken into organization culture and how organization culture changes after we take certain ways of thinking. That was lecture number one, pretty much. And then, of course, this is not a big course. This is a three credit course. We can't have time to go through everything. But those of you, of course, you might be familiar if you have studied change management anywhere. I think this is a good summary uh, from a, actually from a master's thesis from a few years back. Uh, <clears throat> from Mr. Heyer, who put together this in a really good background study. So if you just want to see some of these go really way back, like the Lewin and the Cartwright from 1951, of how do you <laughs> manage change in organizations and what kind of models you have. And then we have, uh, I think, the Cotter from 1995 is, a, is almost a classic and all this. So definitely, if, if Go for it, study this further, and, and there's so much more into this. If this is the first time you're actually more kind of formally looking into change management. So make no mistake, there's plenty of this. And we are scratching one surface of this big, big topic. And I guess one of the angles is facilitation here. One, one disclaimer here, I'd like yep. to say, when having these very uh, nice models and, and structured ways that, that the change goes like this. So in, in practice, much more, it's much messier process anyway, and there is back and forth and iteration and so on. So it, there's also maybe other, other models and concepts, but in a way, uh, this can be helpful that there is some, uh, let's say, uh, elements to which we can add probability that, that we are successful and support the change. So that's that's, Maybe I have this kind of orientation more, but having a, having this kind of models is 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 good, but then having a critical eye as well. I I really like the models as way of communicating. Just imagining mm -hmm. that you have to tell other people, hey, hey, we need to change, <laughs> and people are, what do you mean? Well, let's you know, we could do it like this, or we could do it like this. So models are really good at way of communicating, mm -hmm. which is pretty much the point of this course now is that we provide you with tools which are not perfect as such but they probably start conversations you should yeah. start which brings me to last week's exercise <clears throat> and before we go there hmm, uh, i try to be very uh, how should i say constructive with this feedback and this is doesn't mean all of you but there were still some of you dear people who didn't <laughs> really check this from last week. So this is again the same comment as last week, but now I put the font a little bit bigger and I made it green. So let's see next week if it's even bigger and even greener. But remember first, 
return also your reflections. Some of you didn't. Uh, reflect on the tool, not on the other person's work. Some of you still did that. Third, please add the other person's name or make it clear if there was another person or you did it for some reason yourself. Again, some of you didn't do that. Uh, and then last but not least, this week especially, please have a really good look of what we have asked you to do, because I think there were two or three of you who did something completely different that wasn't what we asked. So we try to be really clear. And if you have any questions, there's the Slack channel and there's the email channel and Lee and Kiara will definitely help to clarify things. So that as a, as a reminder for still few of you there. But let's get to the actual exercise. Uh, again, I picked a couple of re really good comments from your reflections and uh, for such as this that remember we I, we asked you to do the timeline which we also call the temporal onion that you put the project in the middle think about it before what needs to happen before the project starts and especially you need to think about what's the future impact that the project will cause in the end and the things that you clar uh, kind of underlined here was that for example one person said that help me clarify some parts of the project as being more important than initially anticipated so this was definitely one of the things we were hoping that the tool thinks that once you start looking at the at the future, what will happen in the future after the project is done, it helps you actually look at the project from a different perspective. Another one here is that actually two comments from different people. I believe that this approach will help manage expectations from client and also just <laughs> saying that this tool actually might help. Why are we doing this project in the first place? And actually, many of you thought about, yeah, this is actually really good at clarifying the big picture again. Of course, the first assignment was very much about the big picture as well. And now you can probably see that actually, what does it mean to have a clear big picture? Is definitely not, now people's expectations are aligned. People kind of like, ah, okay, now that we see the small thing we are doing in a large context, we can start the discussions start to show that maybe we have different expectations about this, especially in the temporal exercise we did this week, that if people are expecting the impact in the future to be different, then we're probably having different expectations why this project is done. So big picture, expectations go hand in hand. It felt a bit funny at first to think about the after in three different steps, but it was actually good to split up the tracking into concrete goals at different times. Mm. Uh, again, I think that was really showing that typically if you're doing good project management, you do somehow discuss and maybe write down the desired impact. But that desired impact can be again chopped down into kind of three stages as well, just what we asked you to do. That, okay, if this is the ultimate impact we're aiming at. What needs to happen in one year? What needs to happen six months, one month? So it's kind of like a classical, again, maybe expectations management, but also because now we start to see that if this project builds this, where will it go next? So that success continues. It would be good to always incorporate the after part tool in planning and measuring. Yeah. And again, this is not rocket science, if you will, uh, but somehow we kind of forget to do that, especially, you know, if you're giving a project and a budget and, and if there is kind of a clear end, and I think some of you pointed really nicely that not necessarily that your work doesn't have a clear end like a project, uh, which also brings another question. So what do you actually, what is the after part if you're working on something that doesn't have a clear end? Do you ever discuss these kind of temporal dimensions in such a case? Should you maybe have artif artificial ends of projects so you can have discussions of the impact? So that kind of things, hopefully, you, you know, start thinking and asking and having conversations about when you are forced to do exercises like this. Uh, anything else? Anything anybody want to add? Good, bad, just a random comment either in the chat or shouting out loud.
just write it there in the chat. I, I'll continue now. I'll get back to it once, once there is something. But now that we have asked you to do two exercises, uh, and I'm now going to introduce the third one for the coming week. We're kind of hoping that you see that there's a there's a certain theme here or, or a certain reason why we're asking you to do this. So the first exercise was the onion. And the point was that we're mapping the organizational context, that you're trying to do a change there. You're trying to facilitate change in an organization. So let's do a simple discussion of, of what do you, how do we see the organization and what, what's important and what are the different layers that are important in this context. Last week, we asked you to do the timeline, which is kind of a temporal context. So kind of what are the, what are the layers in a time axis, which was really about, do we agree what's the desired impact for change? If we're doing an organizational change, let's map the organization. And now we're kind of mapping the change with the focus being that, hey, do we all agree that this is the impact we're looking for? Is this the time frame we're looking for? And so forth and so forth. So the third one, oh, actually a couple of notes before that. The first note is something I said already last week, that remember these are facilitation tools. <laughs> these are not magical spells that will immediately give you answers, but the magic happens in having certain conversations and listening to people and, and you know doing what we asked you to do in exercises. So these are tools for you to spot issues, to see problems, you know, maybe to anticipate challenges and so forth and so forth. And other point as well is that we're hoping that at this stage, now that you have done two of these exercises, that you're perhaps start to see what's the difference between facilitation and coming up with answers. And that's actually the reason why we're kind of cross crossing that you do the other person's context, because now you don't have the answers, obviously, because you're probably strange people to each other. So you really have to do the facilitation part. But if you would do this alone, you would probably just give give the answers. And what is the right context? What is the right desired impact? What are the right goals? Kind of go into the actual content of the matter at hand. But we're hoping that this kind of shows you that there's a difference between facilitating somebody else to give those answers and giving the answers. And these tools, like I've said many times, are actually for the facilitation part. The answers are important. That's what we really want. But these are kind of the, how do we make that process perhaps more better? Mauno has a comment. Would be interesting to implement the same exercise, but for programs rather than projects, which do not have a set of end date, but more in iterative nature. And hence the model would be, would it be linear? Mm -hmm. I think that's a good that's a good uh, point and kind of like, how do we do then? Because if you don't have an end, do you have then milestones? And once you have milestones, well, those are kind of ends in itself. So how do you, I think as, as a, maybe thinking about work, maybe it's a leadership thing as well that we probably, should we actually have like artificial milestones so that we can kind of grasp what we are doing and not maybe having just an open end this will go from here to eternity. Oh, good point. Good point. So time to go exercise number three. And exercise number three really picks up for what you, we asked you to do last week, because we were pretty much asking you to tell, like I've said, desired impact and chop it into three pieces. One month, three months, or one month, six months, three months, one, whatever was the time criteria. Uh, so exercise three is really exercising how do you write and communicate good success criteria. And there are many, at least two, I think, nice, how should I say, I, would, I, I was about to say slogans of how to do this. Maybe they are slogans, but maybe they are some kind of like memory games that what makes good success criteria. The first one is dumb which is doable that, you know, if you're going to give somebody a good, if this is our success criteria, is it doable? Is it understandable? Is it measurable? Is it beneficial? 
doable, we can do it, understandable, everybody gets it, measurable, we can somehow measure whether we're reaching it, beneficial, it's actually taking us forward where we want to go. And surprise, surprise, the, uh, these are actually <laughs> hard to achieve. Uh, it's easier to say that, hey, let's make those goals really D-U-M-B. Uh, but if you have ever, and I'm not sure everybody has, kind of tried to write down success criteria or goals or objectives, whatever you call them, it's not that simple. But I would say it's always worth trying, worth pursuing. And there's other frameworks, I guess that's another way of putting it. So kind of in opposition to dumb, you can have smart goals. Uh, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. And you can see eh, they're smart and dumb are maybe closer to each other than you would, would actually think. And again, uh, maybe the theme of this course is that we are not going to teach you some very complex uh, solutions, but just to underline how some simple things are maybe more difficult than we actually think. And the thing about goals or success criteria or objectives, whatever you call it, we all know that having goals is important. That's a way that we reach things. That's the way we understand that this is what we need to do. And we all understand that communication is important, especially if we are more than just one person in the team, we need to communicate. And therefore, we understand that communicating goals is important, but at least in my experience of 25 years of work life it's 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 so very hard and, and why don't we do it and i'm saying that here's my example what i mean that why it's so hard because i think we are often just we're writing down goals but they're very ambiguous and by ambiguity i mean here that we write down a goal but we write it so that we don't really know if we have achieved it or not. So here's, I just threw four, you know, maybe these sound familiar to your work. Our goal is that the user experience has changed or the goal of this program is that our staff has updated their ways of working or maybe our goal is to have new customers. Yeah, that's a good goal. Uh, our goal is to have a healthy organization. But once you need to kind of, you take that goal and, and somebody gives it to you or you discuss it together and now you actually start need to start doing things to reach that goal, you can see how well written it was. So just as an example, I think these goals probably raise new questions such as the first one that if the goal of the project is to change the user experience, so is it even enough if we just change the UI? And uh, if we want new customers, is, is one enough? Have we reached our goal if we have one more customer? And so forth and so forth. But if we kind of really try to make dumb goals, goals that are doable, understandable, measurable, beneficial, I think it's all about, at least we try to achieve, like I said in the beginning, this is difficult, but it's worth pursuing. The basic thing is that Let's try to make goals that we're quite clear if we reach it or not. So kind of like, it's almost obvious. We either get there or we don't. 200 new customers by June. That's less ambiguous. Our funding and proposal is accepted. That's pretty yes, no. My thesis is submitted. It is either submitted or it isn't. There's no vagueness about it. And so forth. But somehow we kind of sell them again. Like I said, this is very difficult. And this is my list of why this is so difficult. Kind of your usual excuses why we make ambiguous goals. It's actually complex and difficult. That might be true. Uh, it's not my job. I'm waiting for the boss person above to do it. There are too many stakeholders and networks. and It's kind of like the complexity again. But, you know, I can write down something, but then I need to ask that person and that person and the stakeholders and you know, all that. 
maybe your goal is something you can't put a number on it and that's why you keep it vague mm. better user experience i think that's a good one how do you quantify that uh then i think professionals you know that they, they can say well i know when we have reached it we will know when we are there and i think there's a there's a point there but it's still a bit vague and then the classic is almost like well we've never done it before maybe we're designing something we have never done and doesn't exist so how can we put a goal on it we don't know yet what the outcome will be and then of course last but not least no one actually asked to do it but this kind of again the facilitator comes here what i call playing dumb let's imagine that maybe you just had a your colleague or or your somebody else in that situation and how do you help them to make better goals where well, here's a bunch of sparring questions facilitating questions such as how will you know you have been successful when you know july 22 comes uh how do you know what what's the criteria and kind of the things you already saw from last week's exercise how do you know you know plan putting the goals into the goal posts into the future and how do you know it has happened how do you know it has not happened and so forth maybe asking for numbers is one customer enough should it be a number should it be a percentage what you know can you put a number on it is a good question and this is general how do you measure that if dumb the m in dumb is measurable how do you start the conversation how do we measure this or are we just happy with goals that are not actually measurable? Thank you, Philippe, for your addition to this. <laughs> it's hard because it is important. I think there's a truth in that as well. And just as a side note, you know, playing dumb, so facilitation and leadership in a way is very often asking just silly questions, asking maybe stupid questions, or maybe somebody would say these are actually very annoying questions. And we're hoping you kind of get to practice those annoying questions in this course a little bit. One little trick I use and uh, is what I call is playing dumb with champagne. And I've used this quite many often in projects is that Kind of a little bit playful about it that let's say that we're designing a project or we're designing a service or a product and we're having a discussion how do we know whether we have been successful the discussion about success criteria maybe something simple like this you know you just go and physically buy a bottle of champagne and then you say that we can open this champagne in august if the following criteria have been achieved so what should i write here on the champagne bottle i have only beer bottles here but let's take here one for example so let's take it you know i just bought this expensive beer bottle so what needs to happen on 31st of august has happened so let's have like three criteria what do i write here and if we can check each of those three we can drink the champagne now that's the kind of mindset you want people when you're facilitating them for goals let's make this very concrete Let's make this very practical. It doesn't have to be, you know, bureaucratic project processes. It can be just a, a just a reward. Whether it's champagne, whether it's beer, whether it's candy, I don't care. But you know, just taking a post-it and going with asking, so how do we know we have succeeded? And having the conversation from there. It typically kind of makes things simple and helps people to think about it. And then once you have those kind of people laughing, oh, ha, ha, so we can get champagne, let's, you know, and then can start, oh, okay, how do we measure this? You know, I'm about to open the refrigerator, but can I actually measure if we have reached this goal? Can I open the refrigerator? And so forth. So, if you think about the two exercises you have done and the next exercise coming next week, so it's really the big context, the desired impact, and what are the success criteria that the change is achieved. So it's pretty much just very close to having the same thing as last week. Because last week, you, when I looked at the answers, you were writing down success criteria. But now having another look, having helping the other person 
sparring, facilitating the other person to have dumb success criteria, helping them to make them D-U-M-B. That's really the exercise. And here's kind of the questions that go with each of these tools. What's the context? What are you trying to achieve? And how do you know whether you have achieved it? Now, let's see how we're doing on time a little bit. Okay, a little bit late. Any questions before we move forward? I have the, in the end, before we end today, kind of again, the slide set for the exercise again. But it is the dumb criteria is the exercise more or less for this one. Okay, put it in the chat. Let's continue with the more of the topic and, and so much about the exercises. But before we go there, let's have a recap. Where are we now in, in the third lecture? So here we are. We have realized that we got to make the organization responsive to remain competitive. We know that there's kind of this fog of uncertainty. We know that organization is, is very diverse and multidimensional. And last but not least, one of the big things that we have realized that seems to work quite well is that we change people's doing and behavior, just like John Shook did in the 80s um, car manufacturing. And uh, this is what we kind of already have. We have kind of as in our toolbox. We Maybe you have, at least we talked a little bit about having a vision of what a new company culture might look like. Uh, we have some kind of tools of how to make a change program. And we have done two out of those three tools. But first, we kind of chart the, the context and then the temporal dimension. And then next week or this week, we're going to look into the measurable goals. So as a reminder, you know, let's start continue from this slide we had earlier that we are in an uncertainty and we want to have change in it, whether it's big or small, whole organization. And like I said, we can't plan it because there's the fog. Uh, culture seems to be the answer nowadays, but it's actually a culture of doing. Doing is very much about routines and tools. And that's where we get to these fancy words again. Routines and tools are at the moment as we speak so much in fashion when it you know, we go to the Lean Startup, the book I actually happen to have here all the time, Agile Thinking, Agile Methods, Design Thinking, Design Methods, and so forth. And I think we had this earlier as well. That's why we have all these canvases and tools and tool, you know, toolboxes and everything. They're tools as such, but the tools bring a certain mindset, a certain way of working. They actually push us to behave in certain ways. And this was the logic we had. Like I said, uncertainty, building a responsive culture, culture is doing, routines, tools, practices. We got to these individual tools that are quite popular and most of you are probably familiar with them. And once we accept them and take a little bit of time, we get certain behavior, we get shared thinking, we get a hopefully an autonomous, responsive, shared culture, and ta-da, almost magically our organizations becomes more competitive in this fog of uncertainty. That's the logic. But the question still is, so where do I start? Which one of these is, you know, if this, if this is the medicine. This is how I've been introducing it. Here's a here's different vitamins that you should think take, but which, which one is better? Which one should you take? And just to kind of a recap, we have these different schools of thinking, different vitamins. So vitamin A, vitamin agile is, is I think we mentioned that in the first lecture, it comes from the software development world. And their four big principles are here in the middle. Then we have the classic lean, that is really something that grew out of the Japanese car industry and has been used quite outside the software industry in its long history of like 40 years or so. And we have you know, principles such as these, process improvement, capability development, situational approach, that's 
exactly the kind of contextual thinking we've been doing. And we have different versions of lean, obviously. Here's another house of lean, where in the middle we have action and reflection going in a loop all the time. And how do you create the whole learning organization based on this? And then the third lean is kind of classic Six Sigma lean is, is, is like talking about the wasties in a process. Here, something like close to a logistic chain. But where are the wasties and what kind of you know lenses we should look into that. We have the lean startup, the book over there. And you can see again, we have this reflection doing cycle in the middle, build, measure, learn, build, measure, learn. Then we have the classical human-centric design approach where we start with the desirability from the end users and their feasibility and viability and have, have a look at that as well. And these are all kind of different approaches, different schools, and people have put these together. There's a link at the end of today's slides into this video that is in, in Ule Arena, where Jeff Gotthelf just pretty much puts these all together. And, comes up with his principles, 10 principles of that work with any methodology. So whatever vitamins you should take, you should at least have these ingredients, if you will. And there's good stuff there, there's no doubt about it. But actually the question I want to ask is this. So if this is the medicine, these are the vitamins, then kind of what's the root cause? What is the illness they're curing? So if I take a he headache pill, what is actually causing my headache? Where does it come from? And in my experience, a lot of people, and you know, myself included, started just using these things. And maybe you know, a lot of people fall in love with these things like design thinking or agile methodology. And never perhaps having the question that, okay, uh, so what's kind of behind them? What, you know, should I take design or agile or some kind of a lean principle? Which one should I take? Well, once you kind of understand what you're trying to cure, then maybe that should help. Does DevOps count as vitamin as much as agile? Yeah, I think DevOps is in a kind of a different position in some kind of a map of things, but I think DevOps, does it have some similar <laughs> religious attributes I, I don't know but definitely it's kind of a stamp of you know these are things you should do and all that but i don't know felipe you tell me after this slide because i'm telling you this is kind of what i'm is that once you kind of take all of these together and they have so much similarities between them but the one or let's say two things the only the very strong thing that they all have similar, these methodologies and tools. The question they're all trying to answer at the end of the day is that when you're doing work, how do you know what is valuable and what is valued in general in the work context? These are work tools at the end of the day. They're trying to facilitate you to understand what is valuable work and what is valued in general. Plus, like it says in the slide, there's lots and lots and lots about teamwork, uncertainty, communications, and not being fixated on one solution. And that's if you, you know, for those of you maybe in a experience with a kind of agile software development, it's all about, you know, are we creating value and what is valuable here? And I think that language comes from the lean kind of classical lean thinking. Uh, so the kind of value thing is very in the center. And I think it's really interesting that nowadays, because we're talking so much about societal value, that's kind of for having the word value coming in from a very different angle again. So, you know, as an organization, we should produce value. It also means that we should, you know, produce societal value as well as you know, customer value, and maybe we have our internal value, and then we all as individuals have our values. And you know, a lot of people are thinking that I wanna work in a place that is you know, in sync with my own personal values. So everything seems to really be boiling down into the word value, and that's kind of the hinge that everything hinges on. 
it kind of brings the question that, okay, if you're a leader or you're a facilitator, why don't we just solve the value? Let's get the value from the shelf of different values here. Here's value one. Let's just take your spoonful of this value, put it into the organization, and everything falls into place. Problem solved. We're done. Let's define what is the most valuable thing we all agree on, and everything is solved. And there's another reminder of how the word value is so very much used. And I'm not saying it's, it's a kind of a chicken egg thing. Is it because value is so important that all of these tools are actually helping you to, to come up with an answer to it? Or is it that these tools push people to talk about value that we talk about value so much? But here's kind of the summary of the problem is that if you're working for a bigger organization than one and the number of employees then you have the same number definition of value and if you just tell people let's create value <laughs> you can see that it gets really really difficult good luck with that let me know we should drive value in our organization and then of course the thing is that the when you start thinking about this kind of deeper and deeper, the thing is that there are, of course, no ready answers. And we just cannot take value from a jar and add it into our organization. And that's, that's the thing. Although, at least in my experience, that's how often people seem to be thinking or using the word value. But the thing we can do is have shared meanings. And that's really what the second half of today's lecture is about that we can start actually working, that we share certain meanings, that we share, for example, what do we as a group of people mean by the word value? But that requires work. That's what requires facilitation. And I don't know, I put this kind of old, old geezer there in the picture, thinking about how the world is changing. And Maybe those of you who have been working longer in the work life kind of can understand this old, old leader. But there's no single, first of all, what we've been talking, there is no single definition of what is organization, no definition of what is culture. So it's a mess. And now I just try to convince you that the same goes for the word value. So everything was just fine. We were just creating customer value, societal value, but now, at least I'm telling you, there's no clear definition of that either. And maybe that tells you something. Maybe in the old days, when people were not thinking about these things, or maybe the old way of thinking was that we have this one organization and we can draw it in boxes and arrows. And maybe the boss people can tell you that this is the value. Let's put it into posters on a wall. These are the values. That's the end of discussion. Next things really simple speaking of discussion what do you think let's see a couple of comments let's see laura says i think modern agile is better concept for change management why do you think that laura and then Felipe, i already checked that one katarina is there what if the medicine is the wrong recipe for treatment let's say misfit of your strategy how do you adjust? Do you mean that the strategy doesn't have room for lean or agile thinking or, or kind of new ways of working? Yeah, let's say, um, for example, if it's kind of a wrong approach and that you selected for the strategy of your organization and it fails, like how do you adjust um, like it? So do you change it and how do you change it? That kind of approach I meant. Mm, I think that's a good point. I guess that's perhaps the reason why I'm so much talking about the value stuff. So rather than just taking an approach, taking a methodology, do I have any methodology books here at hand? Uh, that you just cannot take a methodology and then just, you know, say that our strategy is to follow, say, lean service creation. But you need to kind of step back and understand what is this methodology helping us to do? And if it's helping us to clarify what is valuable for our organization, 
then I think that, you know, going to the root causes makes it easier to adjust, to makes it better to understand. So what are we trying to achieve? So if our business strategy is saying this and the methodology is saying this, uh, kind of taking a step back is that what, what are we really trying to do here? Not, you know, not having, not putting more fancy words and more fancy methodologies on top of it, but really trying to see through all of it that at the end of the day, we have the customers and they want this and we have our business and our business wants this. And then once we understand the basics, it is probably easier to say that, okay, let's take from agile this and this, and let's take that from design thinking and maybe that from there. That's, that's what's behind it. And then Katerini had a question, do you see value of structure and routines in all of these? Yeah, that's absolutely the point uh, I was trying to make already in the first lecture, that all of these methodologies that are very popular, lean startup, uh, design thinking or different service design kind of a part of design thinking, they are so much about methodologies and routines. And that was, of course, the basic point of John Shook way back then, was that when you go to the routines, when you go to the actual individual, you go to the structures, those are the things you change. And then people, then it will actually make change happen. Well, like last week, I said that, okay, we talked about uh, supportive structures, you know, governance models, PMOs, uh, recruitment, HR models. Those are the structures that you should really focus on. Those are the ones that, you know, shape how people behave. Sorry. Okay, Laura has answered here. Modern Agile takes the people into account more than the traditional Agile manifesto. It's not a super tool, a one mindset to rule them all, but it's more focused on safety, trust, and basics. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're absolutely right. And, and it's all with these kind of schools of thought, like Agile or Design Thinking. It's just, once you're an expert of it, you can see the kind of differences between them, or the differences within them, and the kind of the historical changes, as, as Laura, you have pointed out as well. So if you, I come mainly from a service design background. I mean, there's like different, you know, we'll talk about service design, product design, design thinking is an umbrella concept. So, And again, that's why I'm really trying to kind of here in this lecture to push you to go and take a step back. Not, not to kind of get too, what would be a good word, kind of too detailed on the individual methodology but rather than kind of look at different methodologies and see that, oh, okay, there's a lot of similarities. And what are the similarities? What are they trying to do? It's pretty much the basic thing that once you understand your tools better and what's behind the tools, you know what to tool, pick in what different situation. PPS says, uh, routines help us focus on the essential, creating the added value. So they are there anyway. Humans built the higher capacity of them. Yeah, I think that's one of the big things that once we do make something a routine, then it becomes actually very, very strong. Uh, it was kind of like what it was in this picture as well that we had already in the first lecture. That here we have the routines, tools, practices. You could add structures here, just like you, Katarina, pointed out. And then you turn into kind of individual methods or individual canvases or individual, you know, ways of working. And that kind of, that becomes a routine. If you are doing dailies for a year, that probably becomes a routine for your team. And then actually what you can see is that you have implemented certain behavior and certain actions into people's ways of working. And gradually the thinking, the values and the meanings. And this is really what we're going to do after the break. Speaking of which, how about having that break? Simon goes and, and gives a comment just before we... Let's go for a break. Simon, I'll read your comment during the break. And uh, let's continue five past. Time to continue. Actually, Simon, thanks for your comment. It, I think it's a, 
it's a good introduction to what I'm going to talk about next. So Simon wrote, how do we know that if we did have transparency? That would be the follow on question. The Nordics is not that difficult in other regions. That would be another thing altogether. And I'm reading this so that uh, uh, that kind of transparency that people's you kind of the information flows. And in this context, it's very much kind of that if we mean that this is the value that we're driving at, transparency means that we everybody can see and understand what it means. Or at least that's the way I'm putting it, because that fits really nicely what I'm going to do next. Uh, but yeah, Subi, nice point that the garage door needs a bit of fixing, but I'll do it after the lecture, maybe. So I actually want to ask you to do now is to uh, dive a little bit deeper with me about shared meanings and negotiating meanings. And this is something that what I'm going to introduce you now is something from, from actually uh, we're kind of deeper, <laughs> deeper sciences, social sciences, and how we people as behave. Literally, this is from Etienne Wenger's book of Communities of Practice, which is a great book. It's really a study of, he studied uh, insurance company customer services, and there were like hundreds of them in at least a huge open space office. And he was trying to understand how do they, how do these professionals work together to get things done? And part of it, how do they create shared meanings? Because that's what you have to do when you are a bunch of people trying to work together and get things done. And this, I start with a quote from him, which pretty much came before the break, is that we can't just take meanings, well, that we don't make up meanings independent of the world. But let's take, for example, the word the agile culture, what it means. Of course, the outside world influences that for our company. Uh, but of course, the other call out that neither does the world impose meanings on us means that we just cannot take the outside thing and plug it in like I did suggest earlier on. Well, it kind of, if we want to have shared meanings, shared understanding is another way of putting it. We need to start what he calls the process of negotiation. And what he means by this is that this is the, his kind of theoretical model which I think lies in the very heart of facilitation. But there are two distinct parts of this, and I'm going to go through them soon. But when we as human beings create meanings, whether this is work context or just life in general, there are these, this is this kind of continuous process going on. And here's an example of how, how it looks, or just put it again, simplifying it. So let's imagine that you're in a workplace or a team or organization and you're having a discussion. What is the new culture for us? We need a new company culture. What, it, what does it mean? And what Wenger is explaining to us that we need to realize that things, like I said, come from somewhere. It's not like we just start from scratch and nobody has any idea or any understanding what company culture means for us. But also he can emphasize is that things also go somewhere. That even if we have a really good meeting and define what is company culture for us, it goes somewhere from here and it starts to change because that's how we work as human beings. The meanings change as time goes on. And kind of making a simple example of this is that what he means that let's say that on the 24th of April, new culture meant something like that circle. And then, you know, on the 6th of May, it looked like this. And then again, it's shaped like this. And then it begins, becomes like this. And uh, kind of going back what Yarit said to, uh, not the last week, but two weeks ago, that how much a new culture is about language and meanings and, and the contextuality of it, that things change over time whether we want them or not, they do change because that's how we work as human beings. And again, <clears throat> I said this maybe every time, maybe five times that again, this is pretty obvious, isn't it? There's nothing mystical about this. But again, the other thing I'm keep on saying is that somehow we seem to forget it. We seem to overlook obvious things. And I have this kind of, I don't know, this picture trying to illustrate maybe situations that you have, I don't know, personally been, uh, but at least I kind of 
feel certain familiarity in these situations. Um, that if you're having a conversation like these gentlemen over here, that what is our company culture, then maybe something like this happens, that one person is saying that, the other person is saying that, and it's not going anywhere because everybody's trying to find like the clear definition, kind of trying to find the Wikipedia answer, the right answer, what is the company culture. But if these gentlemen in this picture would understand that it keeps on changing, it keeps on mutating, that the definition, what is company culture for us should change. There's no point in having an argument. What does it really mean? What is the right answer? And that's what I mean that it's, it is obvious, but we somehow we forget it. Somehow we are still trying to find like the clear definitive answer to things when they aren't. And in this case, maybe, you know, maybe you're thinking, or at least I'm thinking of looking at this fake picture is that, hey, gentlemen, you're assuming that there is a single organization and you're assuming that there's a clear definition of value. And that kind of brings a couple of things of this course together that no, they are not. And that makes things a bit complex. But then kind of don't have to be um, Things have to be complex, Don't have, even if they're complex, we can still work with them. So let's look at Wenger's model a little bit more in detail. So the participation part in this model of how we actually start building those shared meanings is this, and I'm sure we're all very familiar with this, that we had to actually kind of bring people together. We let people participate, having those discussions, partly maybe the transparency, we're now listening to you. Uh, let's get that people, let's get a few stakeholders, let's have more and more people participate, having a discussion, what do we mean, for example, by our new company culture? What do we mean by company culture in the first place? So that's participation and, and a blunt way of saying that this is workshopping. <laughs> this, is, this is the kind of bringing people together and putting things on the wall and, and facilitating a workshop. And I'm sure we're all, all familiar with it. But there was the other part as well, the, of the yin yang, was the reification. And reification, of course, comes from the word Latin's word res, which means things and objects, which is, this is a copy paste from vocabulary.com. Reification is a complex idea when you treat something immaterial as a material thing. And the example here is a wedding ring. Wedding ring is, a, or in my case, engagement ring, is a a reification of a relationship between two people. So it's definitely making something material, which is actually immaterial in a sense. And in our work context, it probably means things like this. This stuff we do, that we reify things into documents, plans, maps, maybe videos, instruments, posters, contracts are a fantastic reification of a relationship between an employer and employee. Uh, slides like these are definitely reifications, abstract thoughts put into something concrete, an object. And what Wenger says that these come as a pair, that we always have this process that we kind of let people participate in what do we mean and then we have this reification process that, okay, you know, it can be as simple as thinking that we had this workshop where we discussed what is agile culture for us. And after the workshop, somebody writes down the, you know, the summary of it. So we have the participation and we have the reification. And then when somebody reads that email with the summarization, gives a comment to it, that's again, participation and reification. And there you can see that it just goes on and on and the whole process. But the point is that somewhere there, we are negotiating meanings. And if we facilitate this process, then perhaps we're getting the same shared meanings. We're getting the certain kind of transparency we were talking about earlier. To give a couple of examples, again, the reification part. Uh, of course, this is why we do it. Because if we just have endless workshops and endless discussions with people, 
<laughs> we have trouble remembering. Uh, somebody should take notes. And uh, we actually clarify things. So when you write down things, we make things much more clear. And again, if you just remember the exercises we have made you do, we have forced you to write down things. It actually, you know, is that is, is this what you mean? It's a clarification process. And the participation part, if you just, you know, it kind of helps the limits, you know, makes up for the limitation of the reification. Participation is required if you want really to listen to other people. What do they think? How do they see it? What's their perspective? And it's really the only way to get, you know, different interpretations, to get diversity of thought into what, what does it really mean? What's, what does the word value mean for us? And a way of getting also commitment, ownership. That's, of course, why we include people. That's why we listen to people is that they kind of feel like, OK, somebody listened to me and I said this. Now I take responsibility of what I said. And that's commitment. And really kind of let's have a couple of <laughs> couple of still exercise. Oh, you know, let's, let's chew this a little bit. And I'm sure you recognize that if you're in a situation where we just participation dominates, we have just too much participation, workshop after workshop and listening to people, but nobody's doing the reification part. You're actually going in circles, but not forward. Because nobody's kind of writing down, anchoring the material that you can build on top of when you have the participation. And then again, if you just have too much reification, that you're not having the discussions, you're not listening to people, you're not having a dialogue, then you don't get shared meanings. You don't get commitment. You don't get ownership. It's like, oh, okay. So that's what you think. I don't think like that. And you never asked me about it. So to kind of sum it up how it goes into facilitation. Like in the setting in the beginning, we take principles, tools, ideas from the world. Of course we do. That's probably why you take this course as well. You kind of get maybe some ideas and then you bring them to your own context. But we need to adapt them. It can't be meanings as such. We need to start negotiating them. What does it mean to me? And if you take these ideas into your workplace, you start negotiating with others. Hey, there was this guy at, at this, you know, lecture and he told about this and, you know, what do you think? What does it mean for us? Should we start doing something like this? And this also means that this doesn't happen automatically. We need people who do the reification part. Somebody kind of needs to take action, leadership, and we need people who do the participation part. And I call them curation like a reification part. And then, of course, facilitation is kind of classically the other part. And to put it visually, what I'm really, the way I see it, that we need change agents, we need change leaders who curate the reification. They're just like librarians that, you know, we have all of these reified documents and I'm the one who's keeping track of them so that when we have a participation, when we have our next workshop, we can build on top of all of this work that has been done before. But we also need people who go and do the participation part. People kind of push, you know, yeah, yeah, let's have this conversation. Yeah, let's let's really make an effort to bring those people in. Let's dis you know, let's listen to what they say about this. Or you could call them just leaders. You could call them facilitators or whatever. But I, in some other kind of lectures and talks I've given, it's pretty much the same message when I say that what is leadership nowadays in the kind of resilient and, and organizations. I think it is, it is these two things. As a leader, you're not necessarily the expert who knows everything, but you're the one who's taking responsibility for the reification and the participation and that's the way you kind of lead people towards having shared meanings you're the one who creates those shared meanings 
Any comments? Let's have a little bit of participation here. Let's see. In Spain, it is very difficult. Well, if you say so, I'm not that familiar with Spanish culture. Ari is getting flashbacks of Agile means Scrum. I hope it's a good flashback. What do you say? Is it, I mean, again, this probably sounds very uh, familiar in a way. But perhaps just like me, when I kind of found this Wenger's model, I was like, well, yeah, this actually puts a lot of things together. That this all kind of feels familiar, but I've never thought it like that as a process with these two sides. Daniel wrote something. It's interesting to think about the comments on transparency in the context of participation versus reification. I think that the balance of how much each might be different in different cultures. Mm -hmm. Excellent point, definitely. Uh, how much people are willing <laughs> to have reification or participation is, is of course a very cultural thing. What are people's kind of expectations when they are at work? How much how much should I put myself out there? Or how much do I I'm kind of put my comfort zone of giving input? I think it's a valid point. And I think it's it's a cultural thing, but it's also kind of, you know, I think personal thing as well. Not everybody is is the kind of person that just wants to go out there and give all your opinions and, you know, be very kind of extrovert. I think we are, and we need people who are more quiet. And then as facilitators, of course, it becomes a thing that how do we get everybody's input? We don't just let the kind of people who are more social, to put it bluntly, to give their opinions. We need everybody's input as well. That's a participation challenge, if you will. Alexandra is writing, totally resonates with me, especially adding reification to participation, which is a given in a design-oriented environment, but not so much in a business-oriented environment, where people often stop with the participation part from my experience. Mm. I think there's certain kind of, in my experience, working in a, in a software company, uh, a lot of design with people with a designer background, but then also working with management consultants with a business management background. I think at least kind of these three schools of education, if we take like uh, programming, uh, traditional design, business, they have certain cultures in them as well of how do we think things and how we, do we believe that there's a single answer, for example, or are we happy that, you know, there are like millions of answers, but we just need to choose one. And that's one of the things at least I've been facing quite a lot. You see, if the leaders are experienced experts from the same bubble, they might have applied the old culture and are not able to recognize what needs to be changed. For example, healthcare industry. Oh, yes. I think that's a good call for diversity there. Easter. Diversity of thinking. Yes, please. Yeah, can I comment to, to Simon's oh, uh, go ahead. question? Is, uh, uh, is, is there a need of two persons? Uh, one taking care of the reification and one the participation. I, I think it, it can be both ways, but uh, I, would, I would really, personally, I enjoy the situation where there is two persons taking care of this, that there's one who is really uh, focusing on the participation part and then the, the other who is, who is uh, uh, taking care of the documentation. But of course, that's it's a matter of resources because quite many times it, there is no... <laughs> we can't afford to have two facilitators but uh, and it depends a little bit about the, the situation as well and the tools we're using for the reification uh, because then of course that that process producing meanings and, and producing uh, the, the, the output is is can be very participatory and, and and then they can be combined but then if if we have a let's say emotionally challenging situations then Focusing on the, the participation part is, is is quite often very very uh, demanding. And then if you have to do it at the same same time, documenting and focusing on people's uh, uh, participation process, then uh, and, and listening process, that that then also uh, can can sometimes uh, 
that you're stuck in the middle in a way as a facilitator. But I, I, it depends on, on, on the situation. I just realized that I didn't turn back recording. Just do it now. What sometimes I've, uh, this is probably works very well in the Nordics. Uh, sometimes I've done so that the boss person, I'm going to ask that person to be the secretary, if you will, if it's like a workshop or like a sprint, that the person who's the boss of everybody else, can you do the reification? And then I do the participation. And, and because A, I think it's at the end of the day, that's the job of the boss is to take everybody's opinions and summarize them and, and kind of take care of them. And B, it kind of also lets maybe that the boss is there, but, you know, not necessarily able to dominate the conversations, to put it bluntly. Um, but it also reminds me of Jussi's comment here about, you know, the bubbles and, and having people. Sometimes if you're introducing something new, if you want people to be more diverse in their thinking and ways of doing, then you can assign roles to them. But hey, now you're the participation manager and you're the reification manager. And then it kind of, you know, again, chops things into smaller pieces and then people can kind of start kind of even role playing new ways of working. I think that's one classical way of doing it. It's like the six hats role playing. If you're not so fluent of having different perspectives, then take the Bono six hats as a tool and have people role play it. And once you do it that quite often, ta-da, it becomes a routine. Mm. Let's see what else he said. Daniel says, you'll see, I think your comments applies to any industry or any uh, some leaders or technical experts in the first leaders, seconds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have one example before I'm asking you to do some group work. Uh, my example is from a company. I'm not sure if, if anybody knows this. It's a pretty big Finnish original company, but an international company doing. Uh, actually, you can see these. Uh, last time I saw this, they were building some kind of a, what do you call them? Like a food kiosk where you can, where they cook and you buy food. And the machines where they do the cooking and especially the ventilation, those are the ones that Halton does. And, and they do it like it says there mission statement we enable people's well-being in demanding indoor environments and the reason i want to bring this up here is that now if you look at this company's mission statement we enable people's well-being in demanding indoor environments uh, <laughs> i mean yeah sure uh, but probably it's not you know making you jump up and down and go like whoa that's the awesomest company ever that's not the point it is kind of a mundane sentence. But the thing, the story behind it is that when I talked with the chairman of the board of Haltman, he told me that they actually, the work behind that sentence, if I remember correctly, it took like one or two years where they started having conversations with everybody in the company of what do we do? Why do we exist? Listening to people bringing their ideas together and really, really working on this, that what's the mission for, of our company? So having a conversation, having a dialogue that took over a year and really trying to reach everybody working in the company, plus stakeholders, plus some customers, of really having a conversation. So that the kind of the end result is that one sentence, but that's the tip of the iceberg. Underneath what we can't see is this enormous, shared meaning this enormous negotiation effort they did and what he told me uh, Kai Konon told me was that once they did this kind of magic started happening and those are the bullet points suddenly this one sentence becomes a framework for decision making you know their shareholders get more committed their growth strategy kind of starts with this one sentence uh, helps them differentiate in a market at least for themselves and so forth. But last but not least is the commitment and the ownership part. Everybody working there kind of felt that, yeah, I believe in that sentence because of the whole negotiation exercise they did. So just saying again the same thing, it's not like that sentence is magic, 
but the facilitation work, they did it to create that sentence. That's the magical part. And what, you know, the whole second part of today's lecture was about shared meanings. I think that's a brilliant example of having a shared meaning in an organization. And once everybody more or less understands what we mean by it, then just good things happen. Uh, yeah, Ari, I just read your comment where Ari says, if you just say, here be our new culture, you never succeed. That's why at least at Halton, they really saw the benefit of doing this enormous task of having dialogues and conversations, participation, verification, the works. Okay, ready for breakout rooms, uh, especially Kiara and Lee, if you're there. I'm going to now give the group exercise. Um, it says 15 minutes, but let's see, a little bit less. Let's give you, what time is it? Let's give you 13 minutes and see how it goes. But before we go there, I'm going to give soon the exercise. But just uh, once I'm talking, you know, maybe just spend maybe two minutes, one minute in silence thinking about this before you start the conversation, because soon I'm going to give you the exercise. You probably need to think a little bit before we jump into it. And then you have about 10 minutes to, you know, share your thoughts. Uh, here's what I'm asking you to do is sometimes it doesn't change. Here's what I'm asking you to do. Think of a familiar context for you. Uh, is it making a teamwork or maybe it's uh, how do I create a successful workshop or, or, you know, maybe it's just in generally speaking, how do I manage a product? How do I manage the business I'm responsible for? Anyway, something, a context you've done, you're familiar with. Uh, what meanings you probably have to negotiate? What are the things you need to have a shared meaning with the people you work with? That things would go really well. And, you know, use your own experience. Whether you've been a junior coach for sailing or I don't know what, you have most definitely faced this situation that you need to have a shared meaning for certain things within the people. And so, you know, write down your experiences, write down your thoughts. What, are, what kind of meanings you probably have to negotiate in a work context? And again, really appreciate if you put a summarization of this in the chat afterwards. Take a picture of this. Or oh, no, I know now how to share this slide in the work breakup rooms. And Kiara, if we are ready, then let's just put people into the rooms. Hey, now we are back. Yeah, nobody in the rooms. Uh, thanks. I hope you had a good conversation. Mm. We're a little bit on short on time, so uh, I'll just go start wrapping it up while you write your comments into the chat. So, here, just as an example, of what meanings. So this is actually a workshop, set of workshops we did a few years ago, and they are documented in that book, which is in Finnish, unfortunately, uh, but it's for free for those who like the Finnish language. Nevertheless, we had uh, corporate leaders and experts of uh, work, the changing work and the work life. And we posed the question, what meanings to negotiate? And they came up with this, that most probably, if you're in a leadership position, things you need to negotiate in your organization. Just what is change? How do people think about change? What is considered work? Is it if I'm in the shower in the morning and come up with a great idea, is that work? Uh, if I'm recovering from an intensive work week, is that work? Uh, lifelong learning, what is valued? What is value? Those are discussions. Meta skills. Those are the kind of skills in addition to the classical competencies. And last but not least, what are the silos and borders that uh, are limiting and you know giving scope? And then maybe it's the onions. What what are the ones that make sense to people? Krista. Yes. Can I can I add something? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think one one reminder from our opening lecture as well that 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 uh, uh, I think we we in our communication 
we we our tendency is that that uh, we take for granted quite often that that we don't negotiate the meanings and, and the, in, in change situation or whatever project whatever team we are having i think we can we can always add one one or two or more rounds to ask and 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 uh, and and make sure that we have those core concepts that we we have discussed because we have so abstract and conceptual language and words we are using and 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 uh, we just forget that 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 we interpret all those differently mm -hmm. and 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 so that this is something we can't really emphasize uh, enough <laughs> and and we easily because we are so hurry we are so en enthusiastic we are so let's say think that okay everybody understands this similar way but I think that's the trap that we uh, easily uh, fell in, uh, fall in. Uh, that yeah, way. I think it's always a safe bet to start that people probably understand it in different yeah. ways and then start from that. It's about asking. It's not mm -hmm. about so defining by yourself, but negotiating and uh, and and, and uh, agreeing together. What we mean by this time. I'll try to kind of introduce one more point before we stop because. Uh, as you might have noticed, I never answer the question which one to choose from all those vitamin supplements. Uh, and of course I don't because it depends. <laughs> but I mean, I hope I'm giving you kind of an idea what the process might look like. That once you start working on, on like in these examples, introducing a way of working or a certain kind of methodology or way of thinking into the company. Maybe you start up with, with an individual canvas, individual tool, and then have people participate in it, and then you reify it into your own version. But okay, we took, for example, in this case, that's the, uh, let's see, what is it? That is actually the lean canvas. And then you make your own version of the lean canvas. And then you have people again, use it and participate and give their comments. And you know, then maybe out of that, you kind of get your own principles. Oh, okay, now we can figure out what are our principles of working. And then you have even a bigger crowd and bigger audience. And uh, Yari might tell next week about his example that we talked about while you were in breakout rooms of how to actually facilitate a thousand people and what is the meaning for leadership. But that's the idea that you kind of, kind of start maybe small and then you grow it from this. But of course, the participation and reification becomes different. It's different if you have five people than if you have 5,000 people. That's obvious. But again, but to put these kind of, it's that one of the themes and topics of this course is that, that the reification happens in the tools, the objects, the organization structures. Those are the things that reify how people think, how people behave, how people understand things. And another way of thinking about it is you go to an organization and you don't really like something that is a way of working or you maybe don't like the incentive structure of it. And uh, that's another way of saying that you don't like the way that it is making you think. You don't like the way that it's pushing you to behave. And, and I'm sure that we're all familiar in that situation, that we have certain routines and structures and ways of working that we would like to be otherwise, because we understand that they're pushing us, they're making at the end of the day us to think in a certain way and behave in a certain way. But we can take it around and start designing those. That's the John Shook's point that he learned from the Japanese uh, car manufacturer. Let's change those. And then people start behaving in the way that we like. And maybe do it in a participatory fashion. Okay, we're running out of time. I had one more example, and you might want to, if you want, you can check it out from the slides afterwards. It was pretty much giving an example of what this kind of a process might look like. But we need to wrap it up now. So your next exercise next week is the criteria for champagne. And the deadline is next Wednesday. Noon. So again, you get a pair and you listen to that, that the pair has chosen some kind of a work or project, typically a project, and then you're asking the success criteria, probably in a timeline as well. You, you know, like it says in the slide, ask for the desired impact. One month, three months, six months. You can use one, six, 12 months, you know, what makes sense. 
And then you start the facilitation. Once you have those success criteria in a different time frame, then do the dumb. Play dumb. Ask those dumb questions. Well, how is it doable? Well, how is it? Is it really understandable? And so forth. And then have a look at the slides. There's plenty of those dumb questions for you to answer and practice. And then again, switch roles and then do the reflection part. That's the one we're interested in. And by now, you already see that I'm reading the reflections and kind of picking the quotes from there for everybody to see in the next one. OK, I think that date might be wrong. So it's before noon next Wednesday. It is 11th of May. So the other date was wrong, was it? Yeah, sorry about that. Very confusing, these dates. So believe in the 11th of May. If you're not sure, ask us again. So that was, we're halfway through, almost. You need to do the exercise, then you're actually halfway through the course. Next week, it's going to be Yari. I will be in Norway. So unfortunately, I cannot participate, but I'm sure you'll be having fun with Yari without me. Uh, but don't leave yet, though. Uh, again, a little bit further readings for you. Have a look at the video. I think it's a great talk that Jeff gave a few years ago. Um, that should be worldwide available, actually. There should be no concrete restrictions. So you can check it out there. And then a couple of pointers as well. You can probably see from the titles whether they're interesting to you. And I think the checklist is make sure you write down the attendance for those of you who it is important. So FITEC students and ALTA students, everything will be on medium and then exercise pairs uh, I guess for those of you who are FITEC students, I think there's a little bit more of you who are kind of MIA, missing in action when the pairs are coming. So please, please, please really make an effort when you join the course or everybody who has joined the course to get the credits, please now make an effort to contact your pair. Uh, it doesn't work if we don't have the pairs working. So pay attention to that. And that's my last slide. And my clock says it is six o'clock. And Kiara just sent the attendance form again. Thanks on my behalf. Okay. You see me in two weeks and Yari, you get to see whoever has a camera on next week. Yes. Yeah, see you folks in ne next week. And then we take a deeper dive to, to this, this participation part of this. This, this, uh, this, and 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 talk about the facilitation as a social process. What makes it successful? How we can add probability that we are successful, and 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 we also recap this this exercise as far as I can I can uh, wrap it up. So, but then if there's more questions, then we can talk about that in two weeks as well. But thanks, thanks, and see you next week. Have a good exercise.